Thank you for asking me to comment on the military aggression in Ukraine. Um, I'm not a regional expert and I'm quite remote from the hostilities, but this war is so important we can't ignore its cascading impact. Uh, let me begin by noting that um, you know, many leftist commentators feel obliged, at least at the outset, to reject any position that takes sides on the conflict, neither with NATO nor with Putin. It's a very common sentiment underpinning uh, the refusal to back the actions of either of the aggressions, the aggressors. Uh, to be truly anti-imperialist means we must condemn military brinksmanship on the part of NATO at the same time as we condemn the brutal colonial intervention by Russian forces. Now that position does not imply moral equivalency between the two sides. It merely insists that the blunt practices of imperial militarism are a threat to all of our efforts to create a just and sustainable world. Now, I am sympathetic to this view, but that doesn't mean we can or should speak from some moral high ground above the fray and fog of war. We all have standpoints. And for the purposes of this debate, mine will be from the perspective of the US, which is a warrior state whose military is always at war, either through direct engagement or through proxy conflicts and whose record of belligerence in most parts of the non-Western world since 1945 is completely unparalleled, even by the standards of the European colonial heyday. So it's simply impossible for US-based intellectuals to ignore the, the massive, though uneven, patterns of US military um, interventions overseas if our taxes, our own personal taxes, are funding the Pentagon's war machine and our elected officials are voting for these interventions. For us, then, the Ukraine has to be seen against the backdrop of the disastrous American involvement in two Persian Gulf Wars, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Lebanon, Grenada, Haiti, Nicaragua, Somalia, uh, Bosnia, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Korea, the list goes on. And that's not to mention the countless proxy wars fought during the Cold War era and in its aftermath. Indeed, it's difficult from my standpoint not to see Ukraine as a proxy battlefield, which is increasingly dominated by American weaponry, American intelligence, and American tactical know-how, even if all of that is wielded and mobilized by Ukrainians who, who initiated what has become a national liberation movement for them. Now, some like-minded commentators have suggested that Washington is directing this conflict according to the script of Afghanistan in the 1980s you know, which turned into an infamous Russian quagmire and, uh, and that that is the goal today of, uh, of Washington policymakers. If that is the case, then there is indeed a hard lesson to be learned about the blowback that we witnessed and suffered from arming the Mujahideen during that period. Surely a similar risk presents itself in continuing to funnel advanced weaponry to the Azov Battalion and other groups that are spearheading the hard ultra-nationalist right in the Ukraine. Although they may be a minority, these neo-fascist groups are very well embedded, not just in the military, but in Ukraine's police force and National Guard, and they have their sympathizers within the political class. Washington's support for these extremists during the 2014 Maidan coup and their attacks on Russian populations in eastern Ukraine after established a working relationship that has flourished in the current conflict. Has the blowback from that intimate relationship already begun? Well, armed white supremacists in the US are passionate fanboys of the Azov Battalion. And even the FBI has conceded that Ukrainian neo-Nazis have participated in training and radicalizing these homegrown white nationalists. 
more evidence will surely follow. As for Europe, while several countries have seen an alarming resurgence of organized neo-fascist movements, none of them have been heavily armed, to date at least. That may be about to change regardless of the outcome of the Russian aggression, given how much weaponry is now in the hands of the Ukrainian far right. And, uh, and that is weaponry that's quite likely to circulate, circulate to their allies in other parts of Europe. I think it would be a mistake, however, to take the Afghanistan analogy at more than face value. No one in the 1980s, after all, expected the Mujahideen to lead Afghanistan into an alignment with the capitalist bloc, let alone with NATO. Ukraine, on the other hand, has been groomed as a model neoliberal state since, since, since 1989, basically, and, and has a profile of radical economic inequality to show for it. So even in the absence of the cynical campaign to incorporate Ukraine into NATO, the effort to curate a rival economic oligarchy on Russia's doorstep was probably destined to end in this bloody conflict. And who can say with certitude that this economic offensive was not engineered with the same clarity of purpose as NATO's eastward expansion? Or that disaster capitalists will not reap the spoils of this war during the post-conflict reconstruction. I think it's instructive always to follow the movement of arms, but the trail of dollars may be more revealing in the long term in this instance. A similar argument might be made for the impact of the anti-Russia sanctions on the social fabric of Europe as a whole. The Biden administration scrambled to apply a full suite of actions, our sanctions rather, after the invasion forces advanced on Kiev. But this form of collective punishment was destined to take a savage toll on Russia's civilian populations. And that's very much in keeping with the cruel pattern of US economic warfare that dates to the beginning of the Cuban embargo in the 1960s and has taken countless civilian lives over the years. One and a half million, a third of them children, died in Iraq alone as a result of US sanctions. Now, in what we're seeing is an all too predictable case of blowback, now this punishment has been extended to European households um, because of the squeeze on food and energy supply chains guaranteeing a long and tough winter in many countries and an even longer season of social instability that may amplify the opportunities for the far right to gather power. Central banks have already seized on this supply shock and the excuse of inflation, just like in the 1970s, to engineer a disciplinary recession by hiking interest rates. And who can doubt that American policy hawks who are newly resurgent after the doldrums of the Trump years, who can doubt that they are comforted at the prospect of see seeing the Euro further weaken along with the European political project itself. As for the global South, the impact on more vulnerable populations who are heavily dependent on fuel and grains from the two frontline combatants is even more acute. And it has been accompanied by a revival of the spirit of the non-aligned movement. The specter of acute hunger has spread in tandem with revulsion for the hypocrisy of the bellicose pr promotion of liberal democracy. No one in these parts of the world need to be reminded of the West's record of valuing white lives over the countless black and brown casualties of US military interventions. No one has failed to notice the disparity in treatment according, accorded to refugees from Ukraine, from those displaced by wars in the Middle East and Africa. There, there's no competition in, in the trauma stakes, but rising to the top of the table of double standards surely is the cause of Palestinians, whose right to resist the brutal occupation is rejected and demonized in all of the capitals of the West, 
just as that same right on the part of Ukrainians is lionized and boosted by every means at hand. A generation of young Palestinians have grown up with no memory of the Second Intifada. They look at the adulation and the goodwill poured upon the Ukrainian resistance. And what do they see? They see a bestowal of righteousness that is denied to them. They're almost at the end of the rope that holds them back from taking up arms again in the struggle against the theft of their land and the brutalization of their families. Who can gainsay their right to resist colonial occupation through armed force, a right that is enshrined in UN resolutions and in international law, a right that is invoked and widely recognized by national liberation fighters in Ukraine, but one that is criminalized when it is exercised in Gaza and the West Bank. Let me end these comments then by returning to um, where I began in, uh, with my comments about militarism. Anti-war politics is a left-wing anti-imperialist tradition. It has never been about a blanket rejection of armed resistance, however. But while violence, according to Fanon, while violence is a natural state of colonial rule, many leftists have come to question the ultimate worth of tactical violence on the part of anti-colonial movements. Given the repressive nature of so many post-colonial states forged through armed struggle, the decision of Ukrainians to bravely resist by any means necessary has reopened this debate and resuscitated these questions. But the answers and the test cases surely cannot be confined to the Ukraine alone. Thank you, and I hope you have a very productive discussion.